Hey guys, uh, my name is IBM and uh, today I'm recording for Student and Pressure and I think this is going to be lesson uh, lesson 3. Having seen lesson 1, lesson 2, I think in lesson 1 we introduced force density and pressure where we explore the density, we explore the pressure and in lesson 2 we introduced the concept of force where we define force as the rate of change of momentum. We saw some basic concepts about force um, where we talked about resolving, we reminded ourselves about resolving, which is uh, a unit that or a concept you learned under vectors and scalars. And we explored a few things about um, forces. So in lesson three, I want us to remind ourselves about uh, the basic concepts that you mentioned in IGCSE, and that is basically going to be moments of a force, moment of a couple, and so on and so forth. So let's start. So let's talk about moment of a force. In your IGCSE, your teacher must have told you that the turning effect of a force is what you call moment. The turning effect or the turning effects of forces are what you call moments. In everyday life, we see turning effects. For example, you open your door, you open a door of any and of maybe the refrigerator, you open the door of your house and so on and so forth, you open the window. You, call, you, you apply some force to cause turning. And the turning effect of the force that you have applied is what you call is what we call a moment. You use a spanner to um, open nuts or to undo nuts. You are actually applying a force to cause turning. So the turning effect of a force is what you call moment. So uh, we are saying that the turning effects of forces are seen in the following um Actions, some of them include uh, opening or closing a door window, lid of a container, Ige jerrican, turning, a, turning on a tap, all those are turn, um, effects, all those are turning effects, or that's all those are actions where we see turning effects of the forces. You can talk about doing or undoing a nut using a spanner. We know that it is easier to loosen a nut with a longer spanner than with a short one. You have seen two kids, you have seen kids playing on a seesaw. That is also an example of a turning effect of a force. A pair of scissors or garden shears in use also are examples of actions which involve turning effects of forces. So all these are examples, all the examples that have illustrated here, they are just turning effects of forces. So the turning effect of a force is what we call the moment. You, you define moment as the turning effect of a force in IGCSE. So what factors does this turning effect depend on? In one of the descriptions or in one of the actions, one of the examples of the turning effects, I, get, I said it is easier to loosen, to loosen a nut with a longer spanner or with a long spanner than with a short one. So it's like the turning effect depends not only on the force, but also the distance from the point where turning is going to take place. So the factors which affect the turning effect of a force are basically going to be two. There are two factors which determine the turning effect of a force. The first one is going to be the size of the force or the magnitude of the force. And the second one is the perpendicular distance from the line of action of the force to the pivot. So the pivot in this case or the, uh, the turning point in this case is the point where moments are supposed to be taken or is the point where turning is expected to take place. And therefore, the combined effect of the magnitude of the force and the perpendicular distance from the line of action of the force to the pivot or to the point where moments are taken or to the point where turning takes place is what we call uh, the moment. So we can... Think about moment as the combined effect of the force and the perpendicular distance. So in IGCSE, you just expressed a moment as the turning effect of a force. So it's like a force has a turning effect, which effect is called moment. So what do we mean by moment of a force? So to define moment of a force, we shall look at the magnitude of the force and its perpendicular distance or the perpendicular distance of the line of action of the force from the fixed point where we are taking moments and that fixed point we shall call it uh, the pivot. So the turning effect
the turning effect or the moment of a force is going to be defined as the moment of a force is going to be defined as the product of the force and the perpendicular distance it should be perpendicular distance perpendicular distance of the line of action of the force from the pivot or from the fulcrum or from the turning point so uh, when, what, we, what do we mean by line of action? It could be a line through the direction in which the force is acting. That can be called the line of action. So the moment of a force is the product of the force. And the perpendicular distance of the line of action of the force from a fixed point or from the turning point or from the pivot or from the fulcrum. That's what we mean by the moment of a force. And I think you define the moment of a force the same way in IGCSE as the product of the force and the perpendicular distance of the line of action of the force from the pivot. That is moment of a force. So in this unit or in this lesson, we are go basically going to concentrate on moment of the forces, uh, maybe couples, and so on and so forth. So let's understand in more details what we mean by the moment of a force. So a uh, moment of a force, we have said moment of a force is the product of the force and the perpendicular distance uh, of the line of action from the force. Although moment itself means the turning effect of a force, the moment of a force is going to be the product of the force times the perpendicular distance of the line of action of the force from the pivot or of the force to the turning point. So sometimes, sometimes we shall use the term torque to mean moment. Sometimes we shall use the term torque to mean moment, and sometimes I'll use the letter ta to mean moment or torque. So the assignment of, force, of moment, since it is force times perpendicular distance, and force is measured in newtons, of course perpendicular distance is measured in meters, it means the moment of a force is going to have units are newton meters. Newton meters. Of course, this could be the same units as those of work done which is force times distance. But these units can be expressed in SI base units. So if moment of a force is if moment of a force is force times perpendicular distance, remember force is a mass, it can also be mass times acceleration, then perpendicular distance. The mass is measured in kilograms, acceleration in meters per second squared times distance which is in meters. It means this could be written as kilogram meters squared per second squared so the newton meter in si base units can be written as kilogram meters squared per second squared that is the si that could be the si base unit of uh, of moment which is the same si base unit of work which is the same si base unit of energy so the units are going to be newton meters especially if f is in newtons and distance is in meters and moment is going to be a vector quantity. It is either going to be described as being a clockwise or anticlockwise, which means direction is very important. And I think you mentioned this in IGCSE. Direction is going to be very, very important when we are dealing with moments. Either it is going to be clockwise or anticlockwise. That's why we say that moment is a vector quantity. Moment of a force is a vector quantity, or moment is a vector quantity because direction must always be as um, direction must always be identified. So moment can either be clockwise or anticlockwise. In other words, with the ref with respect to how you are looking at the turning object, it could be clockwise or anticlockwise. So moment is going to be a vector quantity. So this will always depend on on directions. So let us see how we are going to find moments. We are just reminding ourselves about the concepts we mentioned in IGCSE. I added a clock here for people to be able to know, to, to easily see when I say clockwise and anti-clockwise moments. So let's think of simple, simple examples where we are going to take moments. Remember, moment of a force is the product of the force and the perpendicular distance of the line of action of the force. So let's think of a situation where we're going to take moments about this pivot. So this is the force. The line of action is a line which goes through the same direction as the force, or a line of action through the line of the force. That is the line of action of the force. 
So the force must be multiplied by the perpendicular distance. What I mean by perpendicular distance is the length of the line which makes 90 degrees with the force or with the direction of the force. Perpendicular distance. The length of that line which makes 90 degrees with the perpendicular distance, I mean with, uh, with the line of action of the force. That is the perpendicular distance. So since moment is the product of force and perpendicular distance, I just multiply force, which is 4 newtons, and perpendicular distance, which is 3 newtons, and this is going to give me 12 newton meters. Now note that this load, is, if it is there alone, it is like pulling the beam to fall in this direction. It is pulling the beam to fall in that direction, and when you look at the clock in this direction, that is clockwise. Therefore, the moment produced by 4 newtons is actually clockwise. Example number 2. Let's think of a situation where the force is acting at a distance of 2 meters from the pivot to a force of 3 newtons. The line of action of this force is in this direction, this direction here. And the perpendicular distance is the length of the line which makes 90 degrees with the line of action of the force. So in this case, this is pulling at the beam in that direction because this point is fixed. So the beam can only rotate about this point. So the beam is being pulled by that force in that direction. And when you look at the clock, it is actually in the anticlockwise direction. So it's like 3 newtons is going to cause an anticlockwise direction. Therefore, the moment here is going to be, I'll use letter ta for the moment or torque, is going to be 3 newtons times 2 meters, which is going to be 6 newton meters. But this is going to be anticlockwise. So that moment is going to be anticlockwise. Then uh, the third one, the third one, this is the force, the same force is acting, but this time the force, uh, the distance, the 2 meters, this perpendicular distance here, but this is a different length. So we are always looking for the perpendicular distance with the which, uh, I mean the perpendicular distance from the line of action of the force. We are not looking at the length of this, the distance, we are not looking for this distance from where the point the force is acting. But we are looking at the perpendicular distance which the force, I mean from the pivot to the, to the line of action of the force. Therefore, still in this case, the moment or the torque is going to be 3 newtons times 2 meters, if 2 meters is the perpendicular distance. And therefore, still that is going to give us 6 newtons, newton meters, anticlockwise. So there's a difference between this length here and this length here from where the force is acting. This is a, going to be a, a wrong distance. This would be the right distance because it makes the length of this line makes 90 degrees of the line of action of the force. So that is how we found how you found moments in IGCSE, and it is the same concept even here. We just look for the force and the perpendicular distance. Okay. So let's find uh, let's have further examples of finding moments here. So let's think of a situation where a, a, a force F is applied at the point at this point here where the length of the beam from the pivot is L, but the, the distance from the pivot to this point is, is D, and this angle is going to be alpha. I want you to note that for moment of a force, we consider the force times the perpendicular distance, and I've said this is the distance which makes, the, dis the length of the line which makes 90 degrees from the pivot to the force. It makes 90 degrees with the force from the pivot. So this is going to be the perpendicular distance. L will not be the perpendicular distance. So in this case, the moment of the force will be called F times D. Suppose D is not given and you have L. In that case, now you will use alpha. So the concept of resolving that you learned in uh, the first unit of AS physics now come into play. So in this case, I have to use L to find the distance D if D is not known. So if L is, uh, if we use theta, this is going to be opposite, and this is going to be the hypotenuse. Of course, D is going to be the adjacent. So I want to find it, I want to find D, which is in the adjacent, but I have L, which is the hypotenuse. 
So in that case, adjacent hypotenuse that will be cos. So I would say cos of alpha is equal to uh, the adjacent, which I want to find, over the hypotenuse, which is L. This would imply that the distance D would be L cos of alpha. So I have to find D using some trigonometric principles so that I can find the perpendicular distance from the line of action of the force to the pivot. That is how we find moments. So I want you to note that the perpendicular distance from the pivot is D and it is not L. That one is very important. So uh, this moment is of course going to be anti-clockwise because the force is pulling the beam in that direction. Since this point is fixed, the beam will rotate anti-clockwise. So this moment is going to be anti-clockwise. And of course, using trigonometry, I have showed you that D would be called L cos theta. So you would also just find moment from F times L cos theta, where L cos theta is the perpendicular distance. So that is the only thing you never mentioned in IGCSE because in IGCSE you are not resolving forces, you are not resolving distances, you are not using trigonometry in physics to solve or to find distances. Okay, so that is how we find moments in case we don't have the perpendicular distance and maybe the beam or the object is at an angle to the perpendicular distance or the object is uh, at an uh, at a given angle. Okay, so just to remind us again about IGCSE. How do we tell whether the moment is clockwise or anticlockwise? So let's consider the diagram in the figure below in which a uniform meter rule is balanced on a knife edge. So we have a uniform meter rule here which is balanced on a knife edge. Of course, if it is balanced, later on we shall see that uh, the principle of moments apply. That is, uh, the sum of clockwise moments might be equal to the sum of anticlockwise moments. So, is the moment clockwise or anticlockwise? The easiest way to identify whether the moment is clockwise or anticlockwise is always considering the force alone. There are three forces acting here. There is the force F1, the force F2, and there is the force at the pivot, which acts vertically upwards. The perpendicular distance of F1 is Y and of F3 is X. On a knife edge, which is going to act as the pivot. So if I have only F1 acting on the beam, F1 is going to pull the beam downwards. And if this point is fixed, then the beam is going to rotate in this direction, which is going to be clockwise. If F1 is the only force acting on the beam, it is going to force the beam to rotate clockwise, just to follow the clock, which I have shown here. Therefore, it means the moment caused by F1 is going to be clockwise. Ignore F1 and concentrate on F2. If F2 is the only force acting on the beam, remember the pivot, the beam is fixed, so it can only rotate about that point. So the force is going to cause the beam to rotate in this direction. So this is actually in the opposite direction to the clock. Therefore, this is going to cause an anticlockwise moment. Therefore, we are saying that the moment due to F1, of course, is going to be F1 times perpendicular distance, that will be clockwise. And the moment due to F2 is going to be F2 times X, which is going to be anticlockwise. In case, in case F1 times Y equals F2 times X, then the body is going to be said to be in equilibrium according to the principle of moments. If F1 times Y is equal to F2 times X, the body is said to be in equilibrium. That is in accordance with the principle of moments. But of course, if the body is in equilibrium, then there must be a force at the pivot which acts upwards. And of course, later on, we shall see that this force is going to be F1 plus F2 to balance total forces downwards. Because later on, oh, in IGCSE, you mentioned two principles, uh, I mean, two conditions for a body to be in equilibrium. One was after the principle of moments, where the, the sum of clockwise moments was equal to the sum of anticlockwise moments, but the other one was that the resultant force was supposed to be zero. In other words, the force in the forces in any direction cancel out each other. The forces in opposite directions cancel out each other. That is, uh, for a body to be in equilibrium. So if the sum, if the clockwise moment is the same as the anticlockwise moment, we shall say that the body is in equilibrium. So note that the pivot exerts a force. 
This force always acts on a body wherever two bodies are in contact, and that is called the normal reaction force or the contact normal reaction force. So it will be acting on the beam upwards to balance total forces downwards. So um, this force has no moment about the pivot because the perpendicular distance of its line of action from the pivot is zero. Because the force is just acting through the pivot, whenever a force acts through the point we are taking moments, it means that force has no moment. So it means it cannot cause an rotation in any direction. Because if it is acting through the point we are taking moments, its perpendicular distance from that point is zero. Its line of action goes through the point where we are taking moments. So the perpendicular distance is zero. Whenever the force or a line through the uh, whenever a force or the line of action of the force acts through the pivot or it acts through the point we are taking moments it means its perpendicular distance is zero and since moments is force times perpendicular distance then it means its moment is going to be zero quick example So in the figure below, calculate the moment of the force about NA. So let's see the figure here. So this is the figure. We want to calculate the moment of the force about the NA. In IGCSE, you need to do such questions because these involve angles. In IGCSE, you were just doing questions which did not involve any angles at all. But here, angles should come into play now to make this at least more advanced. So we want to calculate the moment of the force about end A. So we are this is going to act as the pivot. End A is acting as the pivot. So to find the moment of a force, we need two things, the, the force and the perpendicular distance. So here we have the length from A to B, which is not the perpendicular distance. The perpendicular distance is going to be the line which makes 90 degrees with the force or the line of action of the force. So I can just draw a line through the force. So this is the line of action of the force. So to find the perpendicular distance, I have two options. I can either consider this point, this line here, because this is making 90 degrees with the line of action through the force. Or I can consider this line here. Still, this is the same thing. It makes 90 degrees with the line of action of the force. So we have two options. Either you consider that one, this one, this distance is the same as this distance here. So you have the choice is yours. So if I consider, if I take this, so this is going to be this, this is going to be in the opposite of the angle of 65. And uh, this is in the hypotenuse. Of the angle of 65. So opposite hypotenuse, I think that is sine. So I would say that sine of the angle 60 is equal to the opposite divided by the hypotenuse, which is, uh, of course, I have to change this to meters. This would be 0 0.45. So divide by 0 0.45. So it means the distance we are talking about here is 0 0.45 sine of 60 that is the perpendicular distance so we can now find the moment i will use the ta for moment or torque as the product of the force times the perpendicular distance so this is going to be the force which is um, 30 newtons times the perpendicular distance which is 0 0.45 sine of 60 of course this is in meters so a sine of 65. So I can check with my college letter. So with my college letter, this is 12.2. Newton meters. So that is the torque or the moment of um, the moment of the moment 
of the force about A. I could also use the angle at the bottom, by the way, because this is still gives me D. So if I use this angle here, remember this is 90 degrees. So this angle is going to be, I think this is 25. So if I use 25 and I want to find the perpendicular distance as D, so this is going to be in the adjacent. And of course, the other one is still the hypotenuse. So that would be cos. So I would say cos. Cos of 25 equals to uh, the adjacent, which is D, divided by the hypotenuse, which is 0 0.45 in meters. So it means the distance is going to be 0 0.45 cos of 25. So it means the torque will still be, I think the torque will still be 30 times 0 0.45 cos of 25. And I think the answer is still the same. So resolving is going to be very important. That's why you cannot learn this part without understanding the, uh, how to do resolving or how to resolve forces or how to resolve vectors. Okay, so having understood how to find moments, I, I can give you a simple self-check. You can always pause the video and try to see if you can solve such questions. But I will always give you a hint. Referring to the diagram in the example above, calculate the moment of the force about F, about A for a vertical force of 25 newtons with a rod at an angle 30 degrees to the vertical. So we are see considering the previous example where we have um, we have the rod at an angle of with the road at an angle of 30 degrees to the vertical. So this angle has changed to 30. No, that will be not 30. So this angle is 30 degrees to the vertical. This length was 45 centimeters. So I just still I just need uh, the perpendicular distance from the pivot to the force. So if that angle is 30, I can use this one as 60, or I can draw a vertical line here, I mean a horizontal line here, and I want the distance d. So it means the distance d is going to be opposite hypotenuse that is sine so sine of 30 is going to be the opposite of a hypotenuse which is 0 0.4 i mean 45 so this implies that the distance d is 0 0.45 sine of 30 so the moment is still going to be equal to 25 times 0 0.45 sine of 30 and I think that answer is correct. 25 times 0 0.45 sine of 30. I think this answer is correct. A uniform road of length 60 centimeters has a weight of 14 newtons. Remember the road is uniform. And in our previous lesson, lesson two, we said if an object is uniform, it means its weight is at the midpoint. So if the weight is 14 newtons, then it is going to be at the center of this road. So 14 newtons is somewhere here acting vertical downwards. So this distance is going to be 30. 30 centimeters. As shown below, the, th the thread makes um, an angle of 50 degrees with the horizontal. Capture the moment of the weight of the road above the pivot. So for the weight, the weight is at the center above the pivot, the perpendicular distance is 30 centimeters. So in this case, the moment of the weight above the pivot is going to be the weight, which is 14 newtons, times the perpendicular distance, which is 30 divided by 100, that is 0 0.3 meters. So times 0 0.3 meters, which I think is going to give us that answer. 14 times 0 0.3, it gives us 4.2, which is correct. Then the tension in the thread required to hold 
uh, the road. So this is where now resolving is going to be very important because you need a perpendicular distance. So the best way, even if you prolong this further backwards, you will not easily find a perpendicular distance. But if you resolve t to the vertical, it is going to be the component of t in the vertical is going to be acting at a perpendicular distance of 60 centimeters because after all, the horizontal component of t will be parallel, will be, I mean, will be acting through the pivot. If I prolong the line for the horizontal component, it will be acting through the pivot. So the horizontal component, which is going to be t cos of 50, this one has no moment about the pivot because its line of action can go through the pivot. But the vertical component, which is going to be t sine of 50, has a, has a moment which is going to be anticlockwise about the pivot. And its perpendicular distance is going to be 60 centimeters. So this is going to be 60 uh, and clockwise, but the weight is going to cause clockwise. So if the rod is in equilibrium and is remaining horizontal, then it means T, the sum of clockwise moment is going to be called the sum of anticlockwise moment. Therefore, I will say that T sine of 50, that is the force times the perpendicular distance, this one is 0 0.6 meters, meters should be equal to the clockwise moment, which is going to be 14 newtons times 0 0.3. So we have that T is going to be, of course, 14 times 0 0.3 is 4.2. Divide by 0 0.6 sine of 50. So this gives me 9.14 or oh, approximately 9.1 newtons. So that would be the tension. So I want you to just mark how I have resolved this so that I just find a component which acts whose perpendicular distance is going to be 60 from the pivot. And this is the only component which has a moment about the pivot. The horizontal component of T will be acting through the pivot. It has its, its line of action go through the pivot. That means the perpendicular distance of the horizontal component is zero. But the perpendicular distance of the vertical component is 60 and is going to cause an anticlockwise moment, which must be the moment that is balancing with the clockwise moment due to the weight of, of the rod. Okay. So let's now talk about the principle of moments. You mentioned this principle of moments in, uh, in IGCSE. We said if the clockwise moment equals the anticlockwise moment, then we can say that the body is in equilibrium. But this is only true if both the clockwise moments and the anticlockwise moments have been taken about the same point. That is in accordance with the principle of moments. So the principle of moments states that for a body in equilibrium, the sum of clockwise moments, it must be the sum of the total clockwise moments. It must be the sum. The sum of clockwise moments about any point is equal to the sum of anticlockwise moments about the same point. So for a body in equilibrium, the sum of clockwise moments about any point is equal to the sum of anticlockwise moments about the same point. That is the principle of moments. To put this in the simplest words, you could simply say that for a body in equilibrium, the net moment on it is zero. For a body in equilibrium, the net moment on it is zero. You can't get a mark for stating the principle of moments without mentioning for a body in equilibrium. So for a body in equilibrium, the sum of clockwise moments about any point is equal to the sum of anticlockwise moments about the same point, about the same point, about the same point. For a body in equilibrium, the sum of clockwise moments about a point is equal to the sum of anticlockwise moments about the same point, or for a body in equilibrium, the net moment on it is zero. So some people will now confuse moment and momentum. 
So they replace moment with the momentum many times. But that is the principle of moments. Let's use this principle in some example and see. So um, let's consider a, a, a uniform rigged body which is balanced on a pivot or on a knife edge as shown here. We want to see if this is in equilibrium. We are going to take moments about O. So if I take moments about O, I want you to notice that 8 newtons is pulling the beam downwards, which is clockwise. 3 newtons is pulling the beam downwards, which is also clockwise. Then 10 newtons is pulling the beam downwards, but the other way around, which is going to be anti-clockwise. So we want to verify if the sum of clockwise moments is equal to the sum of anti-clockwise moments for this object which is balanced. So for this one, the more the clockwise mo anti-clockwise moment is going to be the force times the perpendicular distance, which is going to be 20. So for clockwise anti-clockwise moments, we have 10 newtons times 2 meters, which is going to be 20 newton meters anti-clockwise. So that is the only moment we have on the left hand side, or, we, or, or the only moment, the only anticlockwise moment that we have. Then on the right hand side, the force is 8 newtons times perpendicular distance, which is 1 meter. And that one gives us a force, a moment of um, 8 newtons times 1 meter, which is 8 newton meter. Then we also have a moment caused by 3 newtons, and the perpendicular distance is 4 meters. So this gives us a uh, 3 newtons times 4 meters, which gives us 12 newton meters. So on the left hand side, the total anticlockwise moment is 20 newton meters. On the right hand side, if we add up 8 newton meters and 12 newton meters, the total, the total clockwise moments is also equal to 20 newton meters. So this means uh, this beam is going to be in equilibrium, and the principle of moments is obeyed in this case. We have taken moments on both sides, both clockwise and anticlockwise moments about the same pivot. And we are seeing that the sum of clockwise moments is equal to the sum of anticlockwise moments. So that is the principle of moments. But I want you not to forget that there is a force acting at the pivot, which force tends to balance or to, uh, to balance all the forces acting downwards. That is uh, the total force acting on the pivot, force at the pivot, is going to be 8 newtons plus 3 newtons plus 10 newtons, but this force is going to act upwards. So this is going to be equal to 21 newtons. Is it 21 newtons? Yes, 21 newtons upwards. So that is the reaction at the pivot. Okay, example one is still continued. In the figure, the figure above, what is the upward force from the support? So that one I've already mentioned is going to be 10 plus 8 plus 3, which is equal to 21 newtons. And of course, this acts upwards. The number two. If moments are taken about point P, so assuming we are taking moments about point P, which forces have clockwise moments? So we are taking moments about point P. I want you to recall that the force at the pivot is acting upwards and it is 21 newtons. So this is going to pull the beam in this direction. 8 newtons is pulling the beam in that direction about point P because P is the fixed point. 3 newtons is going to pull the beam in that direction. So the question is if moments are taken about point P, which forces have clockwise moments? What is total uh, clockwise moment? So all the forces here have clockwise moments. So we have the 10 newtons, the 8 newtons, and the 3 newtons will all have clockwise moments because they will all be pulling the beam in the same direction with P if P is the fixed point, or if rotation only takes about point P. Then what is the total clockwise moments about P? So we have to find the perpendicular distances from point P. 
So this distance is going to be 4 meters minus 2, which is 2 meters. Then we have uh, this perpendicular distance here is going to be 4 plus 1, which is 5 meters. And then the other perpendicular distance is 80 meters. So it is going to be 10 newtons times 2 plus uh, 80 newtons times, times 5 plus 3 newtons times 8. The total is 20 plus 40 plus 24, which I think is 80, 84, I think. H times 3, that is 24, plus 20, that is 44, plus 40, that is 84 Newton meters. So that is the total anti -clo total clockwise moment about P. So what is the total anti clockwise moment about P? What is, uh, sorry, what force or forces have anti clockwise moments? So, so that is going to be the 21 Newtons. 21 Newton. Uh, from the pivot It is going to be 21 newtons at O the force acting at O is the one which is going to cause anti-clockwise moments About P. So that is a force which causes anti-clockwise moments and what is the total? Anti-clockwise moment about P. Let's check. So the force is 21 times the perpendicular distance which is 4 So 21 times 4 is going to be 84 Newton meters. So that is the anticlockwise, total anticlockwise moment. The only force acting anticlockwise is the one at the pivot, which is going to pull the beam in that direction. Comparing moments about P, does the principle of moments apply? Of course, yes. The principle of moments applies. The principle of moments applies. They are equal. The principle of moments applies because the sum of clockwise moments is equal to the sum of anticlockwise moments. So that is the principle of moments. So what are the conditions that are for, for a body to be in equilibrium? There are two conditions that you mentioned in IGCSE for a body to be in equilibrium. So we are just reminding ourselves about these two conditions. These are the first one. You mentioned that the resultant force on a body should be zero if the body is to be in equilibrium without forgetting that there were two conditions for which the resultant force was zero. Either the body is at rest or the body is moving with a constant speed. Those were the two conditions you must have mentioned for a body to be, in, uh, I mean for the resultant force to be zero. So the resultant or net force must be zero for a body to be in equilibrium. The resultant or net force must be zero for the body to be in equilibrium. There should be no resultant force acting on the body. If we have several forces, then the forces acting on the body in opposite directions must balance. In other words, they should cancel out each other. Otherwise, they would cause translational motion. So a situation where there is no resultant force or where the net force on the body is zero, we call that a uh, translational equilibrium. The body cannot move, leave one point to another point because there is no translation. There is no movement from one point to another point if the resultant force is zero. But remember, a body can have a resultant force zero, but when it is moving from one point to another, especially if it is moving in a straight line at a constant speed. So, the resultant force should be zero in the first place. That means there should be no translational motion or there should be no, the body should be in what we call translational equilibrium. Number two, for the body to be in equilibrium still, the resultant moment or the resultant uh, torque or the net moment or the net torque about any point must be zero. In the previous example, we took moments at the pivot. We also took moments at point P. And in both cases, the resultant moment 
was equal to zero because the sum of clockwise moment was always the same as the sum of anticlockwise moment. There should be no resultant moment or torque. If there is a resultant moment or torque, the body will now undergo rotation. So this would cause rotational motion if the resultant moment is not zero. So this means that when a body is in equilibrium, the sum of clockwise moments about any point is equal to the sum of anticlockwise moments about the same point. So that is that is extremely very important. So there are two conditions for a body to be in equilibrium. The net resultant force should be zero and the net moment should also be zero. That is, those are the conditions for a body to be in equilibrium. Okay. Further illustrations, let's consider a beam in equilibrium, like this one here. Consider the figure, the figures, each showing a uniform beam in equilibrium under the action of parallel forces. So uh, the, sum of clock or the sum of upward forces must be equal to the sum of downward forces. That means if F1 and F2 are acting upwards, then F1 plus F2 should be equal to F1. I mean F3 plus F4 plus F5 because if these ones are acting downwards and these ones are acting upwards. So if the body is to be in equilibrium, that condition must be satisfied. If the body is to be in equilibrium, the sum of forces must be satisfied. That's number one. Number two, we are considering the bodies in equilibrium. If we have several forces acting on the beam and we are to identify moments, remember the sum of clockwise moments should be called the sum of anticlockwise moments about the same point. So we are now taking moments about this point here, we are, which we are calling the pivot. So if we take moments about this point, of course, F3 is going to pull the beam in that direction. F4 is going to pull the beam in that direction. These are going to cause clockwise moments. And F1 is going to pull the beam in this direction. F2 is going to pull the beam in that direction. These are going to cause what we call anticlockwise. If the beam is in equilibrium, then we have said for the first uh, from the first from the first condition, there must be a force acting at this point here, which means that that force, if I call it F, should be the same as F1 plus F2 plus F3 plus F4, because the resultant force should be zero. However, if the resultant force is zero, we can now concentrate on the moments. The sum of clockwise moments, F1 is the force and this perpendicular distance is D1. So the moment is F1 times D1. F2, the moment is F2 times D2. F3, the moment is F3 times D3. And F4, the moment is F4 times D4. But remember, F1 and F3 are causing clockwise moments. F1 and F2 are causing anti-clockwise moments. Therefore, the sum of clockwise moments must be called the sum of anti-clockwise moments, which means that F3 times D3 plus F4 times D4. Those were the clockwise moments should be called F1 times D1 plus F2 times D2. And of course, the force at the pivot upwards should be the sum of the forces acting downwards. That is the principle of moments, or that is the requirement of the principle of moments. Okay, let's see an example. Example, let's consider I have a plank of 400 newtons resting on two uh, trezors as shown in this diagram. So it is resting on this trezor at P and uh, trezor C at Q. So, uh, of course, there are going to be forces, contact forces at P and contact force at Q. It is uniform, so if we consider it as being uniform, no, it may not be uniform. But if it is uniform, then uh, its weight, which is 400 newtons, must be acting at the midpoint, if it is uniform. Okay, so if P and Q are upward forces exerted by the trezors on the plank, these ones are called normal reaction forces or reactions, then uh, the total forces acting upwards should be called the forces acting downwards, that is according to condition number one. 
that is according to the first condition for a body to be in equilibrium the sum of forces acting in one direction should be equal to the sum of forces acting in the opposite direction so that they cancel out each other now let's take moments about any point moments can be taken about any point but we are going to consider moments at say point c we are going to consider moments at point c I mean at the trace of C. If we if I take a moment at this trace of C, it means the Q, the normal reaction force at Q or which is Q, we don't have moment about this point because its line of action goes through the point where we are taking moments. But P will be pulling the beam in that direction with respect to this fixed point so to be causing a clockwise moment. And the, and the 400 newtons will be pulling the beam in this direction with respect to point where Q is, or where the trace of C is. That means 400 newtons will cause an anticlockwise moment. And if there is equilibrium, these two should be equal. So if moments can be taken about any point, but if we take moments about C, the moment due to Q is going to be zero because the perpendicular distance of the line of action of Q from C is zero. Since Q is just acting through the trace of C, so it has no perpendicular distance. Therefore, we have that the clockwise moment is going to be P times the perpendicular distance from where we are taking moments, which is going to be this distance here, which is three meters plus two meters, which is five meters. And the anticlockwise moment is going to be 400 newtons times this perpendicular distance here, which is 2 meters. But remember, for equilibrium, the two forces must be equal. So since uh, the plank is in equilibrium, we have, uh, we have from condition 2, we have from the condition that the sum of clockwise moments should be called the sum of anticlockwise moments, we shall have, therefore, to equate these two and have P times 5 meters equals to 800 newton meters so p is going to be 160 newtons and also from condition from the condition number one that is uh, the resultant force equals to zero p plus q is 400 we could find q as 200 newtons that is using a moments that is using moments now i want you to note that we can also we could also have taken moments about trezor p and we would obtain the same condition if i take moments about p moments about p moments about p in that case q will have a, a clock an anti clockwise moment which is going to be q times the perpendicular distance from p which is 5 and this will be equal to this uh, 400 will now cause with respect to p because we are taking moments at p at this point here p will not have a moment through the trezor it is uh, the 400 newtons will now cause a, an, a moment which is clockwise so this will be equal to 400 times the perpendicular distance which is 3 and i'm certain that 400 times 3 divided by 5 you will still get 240 as q so still this gives you Q as 240. And when you go and substitute in this equation here, you still get P as 160 Newtons. So you can take moments at about any point, but at whatever point you take moments, remember the force which acts at that point has zero moment. Okay, so a few things we need to note from what we have just discussed there. Do not forget that a body is in equilibrium when there is no resultant force and no resultant moment. There should be no resultant force and no resultant moment. Also, I want you to note that moments can be taken about any point. But if we take moments about the pivot or fulcrum, the moment of the force exerted by the pivot, where we are taking moments is always zero. So the moment exerted at the point where we are taking moments will always be zero because the perpendicular distance of that of that force from the point where we are taking moments is going to be zero sometimes we shall assign positive or you can decide to assign positive uh, to anticlockwise moments 
and a negative sign to clockwise moments or vice versa depending on uh, what is convenient to you. You can decide to make uh, clockwise moments positive and clockwise moments negative but of course at the end of it all if you find the resultant moment you must consider the algebraic sum. And when clockwise and anticlockwise moments are subtracted, then we get the resultant moment, which can be zero or not, depending on uh, the choice of, of moments that we have. Okay. Example. Two forces, 20 newtons and 50 newtons act on a body as shown in the figure below. If the 20 newtons acts at, if the 20 newtons is a, uh, 0 0.1 meters from the pivot and has a clockwise effect with while 50 newton is 0 0.2 meters from the pivot and has anti-clockwise effect. So 50 newtons has anti-clockwise, 20 newtons has clockwise. Catch with the torque on the body. So we want to find the torque. You have two ways of doing this. Either you first find the clockwise and anti-clockwise and subtract or you can assign clockwise positive or negative depending on what you want and anti-clockwise negative. So I will say, I can simply say clockwise moments is going to be equal to 20 times the perpendicular distance which gives us 2 Newton meters. That is clockwise. And then ant clockwise moment is going to be 50 times 0 0.2 which I think is going to be is that 25 sorry this is 10 Newton meters so if I want to find uh, the torque on the body that is going to be the resultant torque it is going to be, uh, because the anti-clockwise moments are bigger, so the resultant torque is going to be 10 minus 2, which is going to be 8 Newton meters. And this is going to be anti-clockwise. Anti because the anti-clockwise moment is bigger, so the resultant is going to be 8 Newton meters anti-clockwise. Remember, moments are vector quantities, so direction is very important. Okay. Example three are uh, four forces. Four forces are uh, ten newtons, twenty newtons, and four, uh, forty newtons act downwards, and a thirty newton and thirty newton act upwards on a beam which is forty centimeters long. The 10 newton is hung at 0 cm mark, the 30 newton acts at 10 cm mark, 20 newtons acts at uh, 20 cm mark, and 40 newton acts at 40 cm mark. If the knife edge is placed at 30 cm mark, catch the resultant moment on, on the body. So we want to find the resultant moment on the body in this case. Okay. So we shall, first of all, we can choose where to take moments. We have two easier options to take moments. We have this one here, and we have this one here. These are the easiest points to take moments. So, of course, the 30 newtons is acting over this, so it means it is causing a tension here, which is 30 newtons. So if I take moments about the pivot here, I'm going to take moments about the pivot. Let this be my pivot for taking moments. So this is pulling the beam in this direction, which is going to be clockwise. 20 newtons will pull the beam in that direction with respect to this fixed point that is going to be anti-clockwise. 10 newtons also going to cause anti-clockwise. The tension in this string is going to cause the beam move in that direction, which is going to be clockwise. So I'll first look for the sum of clockwise moments. which is going to be, uh, the first one is 40 times the perpendicular distance. So this distance here is 40 minus 10, which is 40 minus that, which is 10 centimeters. 
which is 0 0.1 meters. So this is times 0 0.1 plus. Uh, we have we have 30 newtons again times perpendicular distance, which is going to be this distance from here up to this point. So we have 30 minus 10, which is 20. So this distance is 20 centimeters, that is 0 0.2 meters. So this is going to be times 0 0.2 meters. So the sum of clockwise moments is going to be a 40 times 0 0.1 plus 30 times 0 0.2. So the sum of clockwise moments is going to be 10 newton meters. Then the sum of anti-clockwise moments, we have 20 times this distance here, which is 30 minus 10, which is minus 20, which is 10 centimeters. That is 0 0.1 meters. And then we have 10 newtons times perpendicular distance, which is 30 centimeters, which is 0 0.3 meters. So the sum of anti-clockwise moments is going to be 20 times 0 0.1 plus 10 times 0 0.3 so 20 times 0 0.1 plus 10 times 0 0.3 which gives us 5 Newton meter. So the question is, catch the resultant moment. So the resultant is going to be 10 minus 5, which is going to be 5 Newton meters. Remember, the clockwise moments were bigger than anticlockwise moments. So the resultant is going to be clockwise. Okay. So that's how we find the resultant, uh, the resultant moment. Example number four. The figure shows a uniform meter rule. It is a uniform meter rule and the meter rule is 100 centimeters. Since it is uniform, its weight acts at the center. Normally, if the body has a uniform distribution of its particles, it means its mass and its center of gravity coincide. Its center of mass and center of gravity are the same. So um, the figure above shows a uniform meter rule balancing horizontal on a string attached at its 30 centimeter mark. Determine the mass m of the meter rule. Okay. So this is going to be the turning point where the string is attached. So the mass m is going to cause a clockwise moment about this fixed point here where this, the, the ruler is attached. The perpendicular distance is going to be 50, or it is given as 20 centimeters, which is, if you want, you can change it, uh, the units, but I know the centimeters cancels out. The mass of 100 grams is going to cause a anti-clockwise moments. So I would simply say that M times 20 centimeters is going to be equal to, because it's balancing horizontal, it means the resultant moment is zero. So the sum of clockwise moment is equal to the sum of anti-clockwise moments. So M times 20 centimeters is going to be 100 grams times 30 centimeters. Of course, the centimeters cancels out. So M is going to be 100 times 30 divided by 20, which I think is 150 grams. Okay. So that is a brief review about moments. I don't teach this to my students in the class. They must watch the videos and learn on their own if they want, because this is a very simple topic for IGCSE. However, this doesn't mean you are good enough to go in force, density, and pressure. You must watch the solved fast paper questions because they give a picture of, of how this is different from IGCSE. Let's talk about the concept of a couple that you may not have mentioned in IGCSE. The concept of a couple. What do we mean by a couple? Some people prefer to call it a couple, but it's a couple. I know people... Uh, for those students who are couples, they prefer to talk to call this a couple, but it is a couple. So what is a couple? A couple, just like you want to call it a couple, it refers to two. These are two forces. But of course, 
these forces must be parallel to each other. And those, these forces must act in opposite directions. Just like in the ancient days, a couple was a, a male and a female. These days it is different, but essentially these should be pointing in opposite directions. So in, uh, in turning the steering wheel of a car, you pull on one side and push with an equal force on the other side. You are exerting what we are calling a couple because you are putting two forces which are acting in opposite directions on different points of the steering wheel. Also, in turning, um, in turning a water tap, one of your fingers pushes on one end, then another pushes with an equal force on the other end. The same happens when you're riding a bicycle. So, when you are driving, this is what is expected. You exert a pushing force on one side, and a pulling force on the other side. These two forces are equal but act in opposite directions and have a, they have a perpendicular distance between them. They have a perpendicular distance between them. The lines of action of these forces are not expected to meet. That's number one. So the forces are equal in magnitude. Their lines of action will never meet. That means there is a perpendicular distance between them. So these forces cannot converge or diverge because their lines of action should never meet. These two forces, if they are equal and opposite in magnitude and their lines of action never meet, they constitute what we call a couple. When you're riding a bicycle, you exert a pushing force on one direction of the pedal and a pulling force on another direction on the, of the pedal. These two forces are expected to be equal but opposite in magnitude, so they constitute what we call a couple. So what do you mean by a couple, therefore? A couple refers to two. They must be two. They must be opposite power forces. They must be two equal and opposite power forces whose lines of action do not coincide. The lines of action of these forces should never meet. You can't say have this force acting in that direction and this one acting in this direction and this you say this is a couple because these two their lines of action will meet so this does not constitute a couple their lines of action should never meet if they constitute what we call a couple so there is no direction in which a couple can give resultant arise to a resultant force and therefore a couple can only produce a rotation motion but cannot produce a translational motion. So a couple will not move an object from one point to another point but can make the object rotate about the same point. So whenever there is a couple acting on an object, there is a possibility of the object to rotate. That's why we are now we are referring to a steering wheel. You apply a couple to turn the steering wheel. You apply a couple when you are riding a bicycle on the pedals. So, there is no direction in which a couple can give rise to a resultant force. So, that means the resultant force is going to be zero. But a couple can give rise to a resultant moment. That means it will cause rotation. It can give rise to a resultant torque. So, a couple can cause rotation. So, uh, I just want to remind you that there are two types of motion. Although they are not very important, we have what we call translational. That is, involves movement from one point to another. And we have what we call rotation. This involves uh, turning about a fixed point. Of course, remember for a body in equilibrium, there should be translation equilibrium, and there should also be rotation equilibrium. In other words, the body should not move from one point to another, and the body should not rotate about any point if it is in equilibrium. But a couple can cause rotation. So if an object is, uh, if, if a couple acts on an object, we can't say it is in equilibrium because a couple may cause the object to rotate about a fixed point. So a couple can cause rotational motion. So a couple, for any object on which a couple is exerted, we can't say the object is in equilibrium because there will be a resultant torque. Okay, so let's talk about the moment of a couple. So like we have said, a couple uh, causes rotation, so it produces what we call a turning effect on a body. It does not give a linear acceleration, 
In other words, that zot will give, make the body to move from one point to another, but it causes the body to rotate about the same point. So although a turning effect is produced, this turning effect is not called moment. We can't call the turning effect produced by a couple moment. Why? Because this moment, this turning effect is produced by two forces, not one. Normally, moment is the turning effect of a force. But because this turning effect is produced by two forces, we prefer to call it a couple rather than just, I mean, we prefer to call it a um, moment of a couple or we prefer to call it the torque of a couple. So instead, instead, this turning effect is strictly referred to as the torque of a couple. Because the turning effect is produced using uh, is produced by two forces, instead of calling it just moment, many times we shall call it a couple. I mean, a torque or torque of a couple instead of moment of a couple, but refers to the same thing. So the torque of a couple is a measure of the ability to rotate a body on which it is acting. The ability to rotate a body on which it is acting is what we call is the meaning of the word of the term torque of a couple but we can define torque of a couple as the product of one of the forces and the perpendicular distance between the two forces so we get to one of the forces and we multiply it by the perpendicular distance between the two forces as we are going to elaborate the torque of a couple or the moment of a couple is the product of one of the forces that make up a couple and the perpendicular distance between the perpendicular distance between the two forces that make up or that constitute a couple that's what we call the torque of a couple or the moment of a couple product of one of the forces that make up a couple because they are always two and then the perpendicular distance between the two forces let's see how we arrive at that So we are going to consider uh, the diagram, the, the two diagrams besides. Consider the diagram besides of two forces acting on a such like this. It could be um, a steering wheel. So we have two forces, F1 and F2. Let's begin by thinking that maybe F1 and F2 are equal but opposed, so they constitute a couple. And if R1 and R2 are distances from the center, then they constitute what we call the radii or the radius of the disk. But remember, R1 plus R2 is going to be the diameter, which is going to be D. So R1 and R2 is the radius. The diameter is going to be R1 plus R2, and F1 and F2 should be equal to just F because they are going to constitute what we call a couple. If F1 and F2 are not equal, then there will be a resultant force on the disk in one particular direction. So that do, does not constitute a couple because the resultant force produces what we call linear acceleration. Yet for a couple, it should not produce a linear acceleration. It should just produce a turning effect about the same point or it should just produce a rotation about the same a fixed point. So if we take a moment about uh, the center of this figure here let's say this is the center and i take moments so f1 from the center its perpendicular distance is r1 and f2 from the center its perpendicular distance is r2 now that f1 is pulling the beam is causing the beam to move in that direction and f2 is causing the beam in that direction so they are both acting causing the beam to rotate in the same direction so they are both causing a clockwise rotation so the, the, the moment of each of them is going to be clockwise, so we just sum them up. So the total torque is going to be F1 times R1 plus F2 times R2. If I rearrange this, if we just simply rearrange this to be F1 R1 plus F, because F1 and F2 are equal, equal to F, so it will be F into R1 plus F2, but remember R1 plus R2 was the diameter, so it means the torque becomes one of the forces times the perpendicular distance between the two forces. Hence, the moment of a couple or the torque of a couple is the product of one of the forces multiplied by the perpendicular distance between the two forces. That is the torque of a couple. We get one of the forces 
times the perpendicular distance between the two forces, that's what we call a couple. I say they are called a couple because they are two, they are equal in magnitude, they, opposite, they act in opposite directions, and their lines of action should never meet. Their lines of action should never meet. That is what we call a couple. Example. Oh, that is the end of lesson one. See you, I mean lesson three, see you in lesson four.